I'm Sean Delaney, and you're listening to What Got You There. What Got You There is a must-follow for entrepreneurs, creatives, high achievers, and change makers. Each week, I sit down with some of the world's most influential people and focus on the journey behind their success. We uncover the strategy, tactics, and routines that help them get there. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with Sean Delaney? What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you, got you. What got This is my six leadership requirements for a leader of anything. Be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be positive, and walk in the other person's shoes. That's your job. And I, and I really want to say to every leader who's listening to us, what you have done in the last 120 days and what you will do in the next 120 days will define the quality of your contribution as an adult, adult human being. Tom Peters is co-author of In Search of Excellence, the book that changed the way the world does business and often tagged as the best business book ever. Almost 20 books and 30 plus years later, he's still at the forefront of the management guru industry he single-handedly invented. In those 35 years since writing In Search of Excellence, Tom has never stopped studying what's new and making his best predictions on what's to come next. This conversation focuses all Tom's knowledge on how to manage your business in this time of exponentially accelerating change. Not surprisingly, he has a great deal to say about people being the number one thing you should be focused on when striving for excellence. Hey, it's Sean. And before we get started on this week's episode, I wanted to share what I've been working on behind the scenes for the past few months. And that's my new technology job hiring startup called Culture Finders. Culture Finders is here to save the millions of people from working in jobs they hate and dread going to every day. If you've ever been in a job you can't stand or hired someone who looked great on their resume, but turned out not to be great and destructive to your company's culture, then listen up because Culture Finders is for you. Culture Finders is a technology-backed talent matching service that connects job seekers with employers based on optimal culture matching, so both parties can seamlessly merge together. When you create a profile, you'll receive your culture connection score and get matched with your dream company based on maximal compatibility and shared interest. To create your profile, all you have to do is play our fun brain games, uncover your unique personality profile, and answer a few questions. That's it. You're just a few clicks away from connecting to the opportunity that's been waiting for you. If you're a job seeker looking for that dream job or run a company who wants to save the headache of bad hires, head to culturefinders.com to get set up with your culture connection score today. That's culturefinders.com. Tom, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Anybody in these times who says I'm doing fine is either a liar or was born without a brain. And the answer is, things are as okay as they can be. That's the that that's the farthest you can go. All well, all, all all is not well. You're spot on there. We're going to add a little light to this. Hopefully, people can walk away from this being able to be a little bit more tactical and, and understand the bigger grounds. But I would love starting somewhere a yeah, little no, bit no, different. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree with you in that regard. But I thought a really fun jumping off spot would be around someone we both admire. And this is actually a former neighbor of yours. And that's the legendary 49ers coach, Bill Walsh. And when I bring up Coach Walsh's name, I would love to just get your initial thoughts when you hear that name. What do you think about? I think of Bill Walsh and the Cowboys coach, Tom Landry. And I live in New England Patriots land now, and I completely split with Belichick after he lost the Super Bowl to the New York Giants and did not go shake hands with the winning coach. Because what I think of is is I think of Walsh and I think of Landry. Landry always wore his funny little felt hat and was dressed like a gentleman. And Walsh didn't do that. He had, you know, he was more San Francisco, but his shirt was always neatly pressed. And you can, and I love it in general. You can be an incredibly vicious competitor and an extraordinary human being at the same time. 
And so I think about that with Walsh. Uh, oh boy, it's so, so many things it, it, relative to what I do for a living. Uh, I have a Walsh quote in one of my books and he said, when you take over a new team, the thing that's most important is getting the team culture right. And he's saying it just as if it was a business. And, and, and to put oomph behind those words, when Walsh came to San Francisco, they were coming off a 2-14 and 14 season. Uh, Walsh's first season was 2-14. and 14. He was working on other stuff. And his second season was six and 10 and his third season, he won the Super Bowl. Uh, but he was trying to get the, you know, the bedrock, right. And as he said, I was trying to teach these guys that they were professionals and, you know, I don't know whether this would work in 2020, but they had to wear ties when they were on the team bus and, you know, treat this like a professional and so on. So, I mean, he was also the genius and, and all that. Uh, the other thing I remember which is kind of associated with the culture is I was at a uh, breakfast for nonprofit. I was on the board of in Palo Alto and I was sitting next to Bill and I'm going to get pieces of this wrong and NFL freaks who are watching are going to get all over my case. But it was the year that I think Ryan Leaf got drafted ahead of Peyton Manning. And whatever, Leaf was gone in two years because he was just not a very good human being. And I remember saying to Walsh, I said, you guys are supposed to be the world's best people at picking talent. How could you F up that badly? And I remember he turned to me and he said, it's really simple. He said, a lot of my peers get conned by arm strength, strength and how far you can throw a football and they don't pay enough attention to character. And, uh, you know, which I thought was an absolutely one wonderful answer. There's another another football quote like that. Uh, the famous uh, University of Michigan football coach, Bo Schlem, Shem Beckler. Uh, and I remember I used used it in my book as he said, he said, when we went out recruiting, we were always looking for good people. He said, you didn't have to be the superstar. You had to be a good football player, obviously. But we wanted good people. And he said, year in and year out, my good people beat these teams full of superstars. And then he, then he said, and even better than that, when they got out of school, they had much better lives after they got out of the world of football. And, you know, the last, the last one almost, if you're, if you're human, it makes you just kind of want to weep. The other one like that, just sticking with football, which I hate to do. Fortunately, my wife is out and she's not in the house because she despises football. And uh, she would have, you know, turned off the tape recorder by now. Uh, but the other one was, which is really wonderful, and, and it's all about leadership and the parts of leadership I care about. Vince Lombardi, who was one tough old nut for those whose football history goes back. Vince Lombardi said, and I believe this holds for any leader of anything, and it's obviously true for elementary school teachers. He said, you do not have to like all of your players but you must love them. And, you know, it's a wonderful, 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 wonderful statement. Uh, you know, and I think that's true on, I got into a, excuse the language, pissing contest on Twitter when I, uh, last week, when I said, you know, your group of nine people are a family in many respects. They're a community. And people jumped all over me and they said, I've only got one family and it's my family. And then somebody came back with a great quote that says, family doesn't have to do with blood. It has to do with how much you care for people. Mm -hmm. And the quote was better than that. And I'm bastardizing it, I'm sorry to say, but that was the, you know, that was the tone of it. And so, you know, a lot of the, the reason I'm, you and I are having this conversation is I really believe that um, at times like, this point with this extraordinary thing going on around us, thoughtfulness and care is, uh, you know, the all important first 99%. No, absolutely. And it's funny, you bring up treating people differently. Um, and, and John Wooden brings that up. I remember in, in some of his books talking about his coaching philosophy there, you mentioned, uh, coaches relentlessly competitive. And I know you deem yourself as someone who's also 
ferociously competitive. Did you, did you always have that, that fire and that desire to be competitive? <laughs> well, my mother did. <laughs> uh, I, I read something somewhere about these parents who do awful things to get their kids into good schools. And one of them talked about, I mean, honest to God, I know I read this. This is not my aging mind where you're the teacher and you give little Johnny a bad grade. And the next thing you see is Johnny's mother's law, father's both. This is not a mother thing. Johnny's mother and father's lawyer comes into the classroom and wants you to raise the grade. And I saw that story and I said to somebody, I said, I understand that. If I had written a paper in the seventh grade and I had gotten an A on the paper, I can imagine my mother running in to talk to the teacher and saying, he did not work enough for an A. I want you to lower that grade. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm exaggerating, but only by the definition of a smidgen. Uh, I think she had a lot to do with it. And there are various reasons like that that I would only tell my psychiatrist, but she was driven for me to succeed. And, you know, I mean, she was a loving mother and various other things. The best thing, incidentally, and you, you are a, uh, a northerner, uh, and I was a Baltimorean, so I understand that. But, and, and this is, you know, what we've been talking about, this is not unrelated. I said this, my mother was born in Tidewater, Virginia. And I said to somebody, I know that my mother gave me a full dose of motherly love, but I said right ahead of the motherly love thing for all of the problems I have with the South, right ahead of the motherly love thing was good manners because good manners will get you everywhere. Good manners are like, I said to somebody, if you want to be a cynic, uh, good managers, manners are like cheating. If you're nice to people, they will become, you know, with, within your sway. I, I want to tell you one other good manner story, but and none of this is frivolous. It has to do with what you and I are talking about. My mother did teach me those good manners. And about five years ago, uh, I flew in from Boston or San Francisco or wherever to BWI and I landed at BWI 6.30 or 7 in the morning and I had a rental car because I was doing stuff which is neither here nor there but the rental car area at BWI is pretty far away from the airport and you need to get a bus to go out there. So, you know, bus comes along and opens its door and I, I said, Quite politely, I think I said, uh, is this the bus to the rental car area? And the gentleman who was driving the bus, who was African-American, I think, and in, in his mid 50s, maybe. But he got a big smile on his face and he said, don't we usually begin conversations like this with and how are you this morning? And I looked at him and I said, oh, shit, I came from around here. My mother's hand is going to reach down out of the heavens and, you know, praise the Lord and thank you times a million for reminding me of what I damn well should have done. But I love that. And it was the most pleasant voice known to humankind. It was, don't we usually begin conversations like this with how are you this morning? But, oh, and all this stuff. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, pass our hour with little stuff. This is the big stuff. You know, the little stuff is dorky things like strategy. And, it's the people, uh, right? The, the, yeah, it's all about people. Yeah. I was writing something, and I said when my last book came out, you know, I did, as you know, tons of podcasts, and I said, all with incredibly intelligent people, and 90% of them started with, Tom, will you write a lot about people? And I always wanted to say, well, well what the F else is there to <laughs> write about? Uh yeah, I just got into this on Twitter yesterday, and I, I wish I had the exact quote, uh, but there was somebody, and this is one of my high horses in general, uh, and they said something about, you know, and their heart was in the right place, and the line was something like, and people are your most important asset. And I went ballistic. I said, people are not an organization's asset. People are the organization. 
And I know it's a, an apparently trivial linguistic thing. I mean, one of the other things I write, wrote was writing in the book, which I really believe is I want to shoot anybody who uses the term human resources or HR. Uh, I am not a human resource. When I was born on the 7th of November, 1942, in the middle of the night, and I was an only child, my father came into the birthing room and turned to my mother, and he did not say, oh, Evelyn, finally, we have our own little human resource. He did not say that. No, he didn't. <laughs> and, uh, but it's a big, I mean, these are, these are the biggest, the biggest of big deals. And also, I happen to believe, you know, for reasons of COVID and so on. But I also happen to believe that this stuff is the best defense against or offense relative to the incredible incursion of AI. You're not going to beat AI by being, there's a wonderful term. I don't think it's technical. Uh, and it's AI versus IA. And AI is artificial intelligence and IA is intelligence augmented. Uh, and that is using the tools to help you be more effective in your podcast or in peddling, whatever. And, it's a, and so I'm, you know, the title of my new book has an extreme humanization. And uh, I think I don't have any idea with the technology what the hell is going to happen 25 years from now. But to get to 25 years from now, we've got to get through the next 25 years or the next five years or the next two years. And I'm pretty darn sure that really going the extra 20 miles on issues like design and people focus and so on is, uh, is a good strategy. Then I'd love to get your, your take here in terms of as we move more towards tech, there's going to be a lot of engineering background type people, and we know a lot of times the soft skills aren't there for them. How do we blend those two then as we go more towards a technology-focused company? Uh, I wish I had it to read it to you, but there was an article making it in my new book, but didn't unfortunately have, the timing was wrong, it didn't make it into the last book. Google did a study of their top, two, two studies, one study, two pieces, top employees and top teams. And there were eight attributes associated with their top employees. And the first seven were all soft, variables like listens to each other listen listens or is respectful and so on and then they did most innovative teams and google is one of those horrible places where people are assigned i'm an a player or i'm a b player and what they found in this research again and it wasn't close it was by a, a country 25 miles the the B player soft skills meant that the B player teams were wildly more inventive, innovative than the A player teams. And so you know, it was Google's big surprise. I mean, so the important, I'm, I'm going bananas on this right now. Uh, I believe that 100, one in hiring for 100% of slots, including temps, first variable is EQ and empathy, period. Uh, and, and, and I'm tr trying to answer your question by, with a Google thing. And then another one, there's a quote, the guy's name is Peter Miller. And he heads a fast growing middle-sized biotech company called Optinos. And his one-liner to end all one-liners is, we only hire nice people. And he said, and what he said, which is the answer to your question, is he said, there are a lot of jobs in a biotech company that require these arcane scientific skills. But he said, let's take a degree like, and I don't even know the words, but some, you know, very fancy molecular biology degree, whatever that would be. He said, here's the dirty little secret. There are actually a lot of people who have that degree. Don't hire the assholes. 
<laughs> and, and in his case, and remember, this is a biotech company uh, and a damn good one. Uh, you're Mr. Miller. You're the CEO. Uh, I'm the person you're interviewing. And my technical background is making you weep. Uh, and so you and I have an interview and you would give your left arm, Mr. CEO, to hand me the job offer on the spot. But their rule, which they never break, is the person being interviewed must, after they finished with the big dudes, run the gauntlet, which is their term, not, uh, not the generic term. And run the gauntlet means 10 to 15 interviews with people from all over the place. Uh, you know, it could be the receptionist. It could be a junior person in the finance department. But at any rate, you're going to spend five or 10 minutes with 10 to 15 people after you finish with, after I finish with you. And uh, any one of those 10 or 15 people, including the receptionist, has the ability to ding me and make me not get a job offer. So, you know, yes, you need tech tools, but tech tools do not mean an inhumane environment. And, you know, I think a lot of the, one of the biggest problems we've got going now, and you could name a million, of course, is I really think that Facebook's misbehavior um, boggles the mind. And I think Mr. Zuckerberg is a little short on EQ, to be very frank with you. Um, you know, I wish him good health and I wish his family good health, but I wish we could transport him on one of Elon Musk's spaceships to another planet. I think, I think what, what Facebook is doing is awful for humanity. Uh, I just read a book, am reading it. It's only five feet behind me. Uh, all I remember is the, the first word in the title, which is F asterisk, whatever, whatever. It's by the guy, Christopher Wiley, uh, who was the super, super, super duper tech who blew the whistle on Cambridge, at Cambridge Analytica. And the misbehavior these guys did just boggled the mind. But Zuckerberg, and we're not here to talk about Zuckerberg. There was a Zuckerberg quote in a Vanity Fair argument. And he said, I, and this is, this is, very, very close to accurate and exactly accurate on the important points. I would never knowingly do anything illegal, but I live my life immorally. I mean, he was a younger man then. It says a lot, though. <laughs> but I don't care. I mean, that was the term. You know, welcome to Facebook. Uh, and, you know, somebody was talking about one of their algorithms, and they said the algorithms are specifically designed to engender divisiveness because when you engendered divisiveness you get more hits and they get more ad revenue hmm. and anybody who utters a sentence like that ought to be you know put in a straight jacket as far as i'm concerned so in, in terms of eq i know you went through that one biotech what what they're assessing out i mean yeah. this this seems very easily fakeable right i mean we've all been in those interviews where someone's just putting on that smile they're they're doing everything how then do we better protect ourselves as leaders of businesses to make sure i'm not don't... i'm not going to give you the three sentence answer but it can be done uh, for example there is a group out of the university of pennsylvania and they did this huge research project and it's involved with home care, elderly care. It's, it's, so I, I wish I knew the details at any rate. Uh, their tur turnover varied between 50 and 75% per year. And they decided hiring practices ought to be altered. And they did incredible research and it was, you know, good university of Pennsylvania, top flight research, et cetera. Uh, and they came up with the traits of good caregivers and virtually all the traits were EQ-ish traits. Uh, and I'll say two things and then come back to the direct answer after they changed their, and what they said is we stopped emphasizing college degrees and achievements like that and started emphasizing what kind of a human being you were. Their turnover went from 75% to 1.7%. 
and the hospitalizations of their clients went down by two thirds. It was unbelievable. But at any rate, to answer your question, uh, one of the things they did is they had social mixers and, you know, 25 candidates would come in and they were observing, you know, do you listen when I'm talking? Uh, do you do when we chat? Do you have a history of, you know, volunteering for the Red Cross? Do you show, you know, do you show community spirit? Do you show care as a human being? And they're convinced I mean, they spent forever on this damn thing. Yeah. And they came up with seven or eight traits, which in their opinion, defined the empathy thing. And they focus on those traits specifically. But uh, kind of more to your point, uh, if we were talking about that degree, you would demand the piece of paper that proved the degree. Proving EQ is not how the hell I smile or don't smile when I'm having my conversation. You know, the on the, all the lists of great healthcare institutions, Mayo Clinic, uh, usually comes out on top or very near the top. And a couple of friends of mine whose name I don't remember uh, wrote a wonderful book called Management Practices of the Mayo Clinic. And here was my favorite one. You are, this is back to our nice again, damn it. You are planet's top neurosurgeon and you are interviewing for a job at Mayo Clinic. And this is the indirect version of what was the question you asked. And you're talking to me. One of the things that you have no idea that's going on is that during the course of the conversation, I am literally, not figuratively, counting the number of times you use the word we versus the number of times that you use the word I. Do you talk about my team, we, our people were able to do this at the University of Florida and our research center? Or do you say, I was really able to get this thing going or what have you? And, and so I think, I think, I mean, the real answer is relative to the EQ, you got to take it seriously. Yeah. It's not about do you smile during the damn interview. This is, this is life and death. Uh, a guy by the name of Blank wrote a book on hiring, Jeff Smart. And he said, hiring is the single most important thing that any leader does. And I always say at that point in my writing is, could you, Mr. or Ms. Boss, could you literally call yourself a top flight hiring professional? Because hiring is a thing just like playing the cello. And, you know, you get good at it by studying it, by learning it. I mean, it's like listening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sure, you've got, a, you've got a genetic advantage or what have you. But uh, fundamentally, these important tasks can be treated like professional tasks. And what does a leader do for a living? Sure, he hires people. And then this damn DQ thing, to continue with this part of the discussion, uh, Oh, my God, if EQ is not the first 10 traits when you're promoting people into a first line management job, you are the world's number one nitwit. There are a thousand tons of research evidence that say people do not leave companies because the company is good or bad. They leave companies because of their boss. And it doesn't matter whether it's Apple versus Joe and Harry's broken down used car lot. You leave or don't leave because of your boss and your first line boss. And, you know, I was in the Navy for four years and, you know, in the Navy, the Navy is run by chief petty officers. The Army is run by its sergeants. It's not the officers. And this first line leadership, you know, again, the research, want a ton of research, it's there. Uh, for quality first line leadership is affects productivity, affects quality, affects innovativeness, it affects turnover, uh, and you name it. And uh, it, you know, you just you don't promote people with. And again, we you know we tend to do the opposite. You know, I promote the salesperson who's had this great selling career to be the sales boss, and he is the worst human being God ever put on earth in terms of that job. So you can it's. EQ is not some little, oh, let's focus on the salt. Not at all. You can, you can define it as well as you can define the parameters of a, you know, what's under the hood of your car or 
you know, the software code that's under the hood of your car. No, I asked the question. I, I didn't want those quick, quick hit takeaways. I, and I love how you bring so much light and attention to this because it is vital. It is the most important thing. And I think few people are putting the attention to it. And I think that's a big reason we see unhappy people in the workplace and more turnover. So I, I'm so glad you put that much behind that one. Yeah, so and that number that. to go with what you just said, and this is so fascinating to me because it's virtually no variance around the entire world somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 75 people are not engaged, 60 to 75% of people are not engaged with their job. And, you know, the lovely thing, since I talked to a lot of international audiences, it do doesn't matter whether we're talking about Dubai, France, Japan, the United States, or wherever it is, it's always that same number. Two thirds of people are not engaged. And, uh, you know, it's a double tragedy. It's sad for the person, and it's also sad for the effectiveness of the organization. I mean, I like to say to people, you know, I'm glad that you love your family, but unless you were born with a silver spoon, the thing that you are going to spend the, pro the most significant share of your adult waking hours at is your job. And if you piss away from a human standpoint, your job life, you are literally statistically pissing away your life and i don't think that's an extreme statement you know i didn't get the silver spoon you know i went through college by swearing to the navy i would give them four years of service and waiting on frigging tables and washing dishes uh and and you know and so we're we're it, and it's not that this the family part it's just saying statistically you're gonna spend most of your hours at work and if they're nightmarish hours, uh, you know, I'm sad for you. I'm sad for the company. I'm sad for the world. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a terrible tragedy to see this happen. And and one thing I can't help but notice right now is the amount of available resources you have in your head. I mean, obviously the the library behind you, you're clearly very well read. What is that learning process like for you? Because you seem to have a, an exorbitant amount of information piled up in that in the head of yours. Uh, well, let's start with one thing, which is a little bit pertinent at the moment. Um, part of it, obviously, is I chose my parents well, and I arrived with a reasonably decent EQ. You know, there's been all this talk, and, and I'll come back to your, to your point. Uh, and some people are offended by the term white privilege. Uh, I have got enough white privilege to sink a fleet of ships. I said, you want to know my secret to success? I am going to tell you. Brilliant choice of parents. I was born in 42. I came into the world as a white, male, Protestant American. And that was the all-important first 99%, and the rest has been details. And if you don't think so, you are a blooming idiot or seven other words that I would love to use to describe you. Uh, you know, white male, well, white male Protestant American of intelligent, hardworking parents. You take that set of variables and it would have been real hard for me to screw it up uh, in many, many respects. And, and that's really important. But the reason that triggers in, I we, we started out with my mother's rather urgent need for me to achieve. She also made me a reader. Uh, you know, she was shoving history books, kids history books down my throat by the age of five. I was at dinner a couple of years ago with a guy who is a very, very, very big deal investment banker. No, it was not Warren Buffett. But, you know, very, very big leagues, and it was a private dinner, so I'm not going to use his name. But we, we were chatting about God only knows what, and he, he said to me, he said, Tom, what do you think the number one failing is of CEOs? And I was either born or whatever as a smart ass, and so I said, well, I can think of 50 things, but I'm not sure I can pin it down to one. Uh, and he and he looked at me. He wasn't looked at me cruelly. He just looked at me and he said, "Number one failing of CEOs is they don't read enough." And you know, you could have heard that proverbial feather drop. I was just in shock at, at what he said. And so I think 
you know, the, the, the Charlie Munger, who's who Buffett's number two, once said the number one thing that Warren does is read. Uh, and so I think continuing education is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, and so I believe, you know, I really felt two or three years ago that I was, you know, getting way behind the beam with the new technology, uh, even though I was trained as an engineer, blah, 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 blah. And so I basically took a year off and read about artificial intelligence. And it does not make me an expert, but it means that I can understand experts when they're talking and, and know enough. So read, 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 read. That is a huge message that, you know, will come out of my mouth, a student for life or else. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's my secret. I was reading by five and I never stopped. The other thing I would say, which is related, but not quite directly related is I think there's a subset of my reading secret. And that is I read broadly. Hmm. Uh, I read a lot of fiction. Uh, I read a lot of, a lot of history biographies and so on, which takes me to another point. Uh, I've got a product development team of 20 people and boy, do I ever mean this and I wish I could scream it louder on my 20 person team. I want at least one philosophy major, one music major, one theater major, one history major, and a few people who know that one and one equals two. Uh, diversity of thought is the number one secret to innovative success. And there is absolutely no issue about that whatsoever. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a guy who, Scott Page is his name, and I don't remember his book title, uh, but the bottom line was diversity trumps ability. And the kind of research he did was you've got a group that is dealing with a very complicated problem. Uh, and one group is a group of experts and the other group is a kind of random group taken off the streets, albeit obviously they'd have to be articulate at some level. The, the non-expert group always beats the expert group. And it's just, you're coming to things from different angles. Uh, and the best of us are incredibly narrow-minded, uh, which, and, and then you can come back at me on the question, which is, is one other thing which just flew into my mind. And we probably have a lot of people who are leaders listening to us. I am going to share with you one of the most important secrets. Your self-perception of yourself is wrong. Period. All stop. Not kind of wrong. Wrong. People's self-perception is so badly out of whack, it isn't even funny. And I'll give you one quantitative point of proof and then one, one horrible point of proof. The quantitative point of, of, of uh, proof is researchers uh, were researching at a meeting and during this hour long meeting, they were counting interruptions, okay? With 20 people at the table, let's say. Uh, after the meeting, they went up to the boss and they said, how many times did you interrupt people and how many times were you interrupted? And I'm not going to get the number right, but I'm going to get the directionality exactly right. So the boss said, you know, I was probably interrupted eight or nine times. And I do remember one time, I, I think I interrupted once. I may have interrupted twice. He missed by 180 degrees. He had interrupted nine times and he had been interrupted, had been interrupted one time. And he wasn't a liar and he wasn't trying to suck up to me as the researcher. He believed it. And, and you know, that is the nature of the beast. The, the worst the worst one, and this happened, this happened to be a good friend, which is a story, obviously, which won't include a name. He worked for a big company, very successful. And he was headed for, he was, you know, his IQ was about 800 and he was sharp at attack as attack and so on. And he was 
being potentially groomed for a pretty big job. And when you get to senior management in any big company, it's 98% relationships and politics, politics in the good sense of the word, not the bad sense of the word. Uh, and so they went out, they had somebody work with him, and it was a variation on the same theme of the so-called 360 evaluations. Uh, and I mean, this is, this is honestly a tearjerker, and it is for me because he's a close friend. He thought that he was respected and borderline loved by his people, uh, and they hated his guts. He was rude. He interrupted. He didn't give him the time of day. He was always short. I mean, it was, it was I, I guess it would be an exaggeration to say he was off 180, but he sure as hell was off 170, and needless to say, he didn't get the, get the promotion. But it was tragic. But in general... You know, the guy who invented the EQ, Daniel Goleman, uh, has got, I think, an entire book on this topic. But uh, And several leadership people, a bunch of leadership people I respect, I think Marshall Goldman, Goldsmith is one of them, have said that managing yourself is the single most important thing that a leader does. And a significant part of that is knowing how you affect other people. And you're bad at it. I'm bad at it. We're all bad at it. And how you get the good feedback on it is a discussion of another day, but it's just so hugely important. Did you have a wake-up moment in your career when you realized your self-perception on yourself was totally off? Uh, I, I did... And I think it was a wonderful boss who I had when I was at McKinsey. And as you said, I think in the very first question, I'm a pretty driven person. And of course, most people at McKinsey are driven. Uh, but I remember one time, and this was, over, you know, God bless him, it was over, well, it was San Francisco, so it was over Chardonnay, not beer. Uh, you know, over, over a glass of wine, he said, he said, you don't have any idea how pushy you are. And I said, no, I just, you know, trying to get things done. He said, there are ways to get things done. And it does not mean running over people as if you were a Peterbilt truck. And it wasn't that I was terribly rude. It was just I, I, I was always in a rush and I was always in a hurry and I wasn't as respectful as I might have been. And that was, that was it was honestly, uh, it was probably one of the 10 best days of my life, you know, to have gotten that feedback. And when he said it, you know, upon self-reflection, I knew he was right. And I came pretty close, I think, to doing a 180 because I was embarrassed. I was literally sick at my stomach. Uh, and, uh, and I got it. And then I went back to that powerhouse mother of mine and shared it with her. And she said, she said you should have known that. <laughs> yes. She was, listen, my mother... Her first name was Evelyn, and she was referred to as the Evelyn. Can I tell you a story that's just a little wonderful story that is Please. totally related to what you're talking about? Uh, my speakers bureau uh, had its, I don't know, 25th anniversary or something. Now they were moving into a new building, and they the speakers bureau represents people have represented people like Margaret Thatcher. Uh, both bushes, et cetera, et cetera. So reasonably high end crew. So they had a they had a welcome a housewarming party for the new new meeting, new building. And my mother lived nearby. The speakers bureau's in Washington, and she lived in Annapolis. Uh, and she was friends with the guy who runs the speakers bureau, Harry Rhodes. And so I invited her to come to, with with me. And one of the people who was there was uh, General Powell. And my mother, who's also brassy, goes up to General Powell. That's only my mother could do. She said, General Powell, it's nice to meet you, but I did not really come here to meet you. I came here to meet Alma, uh, Mrs. Powell. Powell, to his everlasting credit, looks my mother in the eye and said, Evelyn, I knew you were coming and I asked Alma to stay home tonight. And I was off to do an interview somewhere. I think it was on Baltimore, Washington. And so I left early. My mother stayed around. 
they had dancing. She was probably 91 or 92 and her legs were bad and she had a walker. They had dancing and honest to God, General Powell goes over to my mother and said, Evelyn, I mean, this is, you know, the whatever, it comes out of the Bible somewhere. Came over to my mother and said, Evelyn, put the walker down, you and I are going to dance. But what an incredible human being he is. And I just needed to tell the story because I needed to tell the story. And particularly, which is, you know, and I we're not getting political here, particularly because General Powell was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the current general chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was the one who went and fatigues to Lafayette Park in Washington. I said, I wrote General Powell a note after that happened. I said, I would really love to be introduced to General, I think his name is Milley. I said to General Milley, because I would have the opportunity for him to put his hand out to shake and I would not shake his hand. Hmm. So when he went into Lafayette Park like that, he absolutely negated my two years in Vietnam. And he really did. I mean, there was a time during the Vietnam War, my uncle was a Marine Corps general and General David Shoup was the commandant of the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps has a headquarters, you know, where the commandant lives called 8th and I in Washington. And General Shoup was being interviewed on television uh, at 8th and I. And there were protesters who were marching up and down the street. And so the interviewer looks at General Shoup and he said, General Shoup, what do you think of these protesters? And Shoup looks at him without breaking stride and said, what do I think? I think that's why we're fighting a war in Vietnam so that they can march outside my window. I mean, oh my God, if that, I mean, I'm talking, saying that to you and it, it honestly brings tears to my eyes. You know, and, and, and that's what I said, you know, about this thing. I, he, General Milley threw my two years in Vietnam away when he, when he went into Lafayette Park himself. I never forgive the guy. Hope he never gets COVID. I hope his family members don't get COVID. I hope his cousins don't get COVID. I never wish people ill health, but, I do hope that Dante gives him a 10th ring in hell where he spends eternity. Hmm. This makes me wonder then, you've been around some of the best of all time, and I'm assuming you've taken a lot of those skills. What skill or mindset of yours do you just find hardest to pass on to others? I guess which gets us back to hiring, promoting, and so on. I guess it's Vince Lombardi. You do not need to love your, like your players, but you must love them. Uh, you know, because of COVID and so on in my new book, what, one of the things I'm writing about is an organization is a community. Uh, and, you know, I was defining manager at one point, and I said, the definition of a manager is someone and this is exactly the correct word choice, who is desperate, desperate for each of the 23 people who report to him to grow and to succeed and desperate to have that happen. And that's hard to pass on, particularly to the people who made the same mistake I did and got an MBA, uh, because that's not what they teach you at, at business school. And that's a, that's a growth. That's what they teach at professional schools in general, but don't get me going on that one. Uh, I will let you get me going on that one. Uh, I was a young junior officer in the Navy. I was a Navy CB, which is combat engineers. Uh, my plane lands in the middle of the night in Da Nang, Vietnam. And the next morning I'm in charge because I'm an officer. I'm in charge of a 12 person detachment. The reality of course is the chief runs the detachment technically and legally. I was responsible for that group of 12 people. And, you know, I graduated from Cornell University, graduated from Cornell University with honors, graduated as a civil engineer, couldn't have had a better education. And as I said to somebody, I could have redesigned the Verzano Narrows Bridge blindfolded with my hands tied behind my back. And what was my level of knowledge about leadership? Zero. And I am not, because we're transmitting to our fellow human beings, I'm not going to use the word. But the way, the way we served is we went over for nine, we came home for three and went back for another nine months. When I got home, I went to Ithaca 
and I still don't understand how I had the nerve to do this. And I walked into the dean's office and I looked him in the eye and I said, you effed me. And believe me, I didn't say effed. I said, you effed me over. You gave me a brilliant technical education and you did not give me any preparation for the real world. And, you know, proof of the pudding, I went over in 66 to Vietnam. So we are 54 years past that. And I am as pissed off at what Cornell didn't do for me in 2020 as I was in 1966. And so the point is, that's, you know, the point, I mean, you, go, you go to that and think about technically trained people. Um, and I had this one, my wife and I used to, it won't happen anytime soon, go to New Zealand for a couple of months in the winter. And I teach at the Auckland Business School. And I had a you know, room full of 30 and 31 year olds. I was teaching in organizational effectiveness. A lot of them were Chinese. And I was thinking about the whole thing. So you're a French or British or Chinese or American engineering or technical graduate. Uh, if you're worth a salt, your salt, if you are worth a whatever, a dime, by the second year, you'll be leading a project team. You, know, you can't help it. I don't care. Three-person team, four-week assignment, you will be in a leadership position. And in leadership, people are the ball game. You know, the all-important first 100%. And, you know, and the technical stuff is not how you create a great team. So, I don't, don't ask me that question. It's ridiculous. I've given 2,500 speeches. I've written 18 books, and I still can't communicate to people that people come first. Don't ask me. I've obviously got to be the world's shittiest and exhausted uh, person on earth. You know, I figure 7,500 flight legs, and I still haven't gotten through to more than you know, one eighth of 1%. So don't ask me your stupid damn question. <laughs> it's a great question. It's the best question. But that's the, you know, I, I said to somebody, if you want to understand my work, let me tell you the educational requirement. You must have a signed off certificate of graduation from the fourth grade. And if you've got that, you can understand anything that's important in my work. Uh, and it's and it's really I just want to say one other thing in that regard. It is related to all this. Uh, and I just think this is so important. It's important in terms of what's going on now. Somebody on Twitter said, you know, Elon Musk is one of the two greatest people in the world. And my response, and I thought about it, I said, I admire Mr. Musk, who wouldn't, despite his many, many flaws. And I said, let me tell you how much I admire him. I admire him almost as much as I admire a truly committed third grade teacher who significantly changes the life of 25 kids every year. So she comes in number one, he can be second if he needs to, but she's my hero. And, and it gets back to this management thing again, call it that teacher or call it the boss that people quit if he's not good uh, or she's not good. Uh, a good manager, and I don't mean who becomes CEO of a giant company, a good manager can change dramatically far more lives than the most skillful surgeon in the United States of America, if not the world. If I, ha if I have you working with me for two years and you come out with a different attitude, new skills, you know, ready to take on the world, uh, you know, that's more than any surgeon can do uh, in, in many, in, in, the, in the most important respects. And, you know, it just reminds me of a little story, but it's all related to this. Uh, there was a high-tech chemistry company near me when, when I lived in Palo Alto. It was called Ray Chem. And there was this one guy who just had wild success. And somebody said, you want to know what Jake's number one success thing is? And I said, sure. Uh, I'm working for Jake. And I'm really doing a top flight job. And he comes up to me one day and he said, have I got a deal for you? I said, yeah, look, tell me all about it. He said, the real reality is that given our staffing, 
I am not going to be able to promote you within the next couple of years. And you are too good to be in the job you're in. And so he said, I went out and talked to a couple of my buddies and I have found you the most fabulous slot in Dave Smith's operation known to humankind. He said, you can stay. I'd love you to stay, but I really want you to be able to go where you ought to be able to go. So in other words, he is giving up an extraordinary piece of talent because he considers his success to be whether the men or women who work for him uh, are more successful because they were in his presence. And that to me is, is just pure, unabashed, unadorned beauty in terms of, of, of leadership. That's what it's all about. I'll tell you another way to look at it, which in the middle of, again, COVID-19 and racial injustice is, is really incredibly important. The New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote a column, maybe it was a couple of years ago now, uh, and he talked about what he called resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are, he graduated second in his class at the University of Michigan. He was promoted four times in the first nine years. He's ended up with, you know, very financially successful and so on. Those are resume virtues. The eulogy virtues are obviously what they say about you at your funeral. He went out of his way to help other people. He did this. He did that. His you know, whatever. We have a neighbor right now who's renting a property from us. And uh, his his wife has had a severe illness for 30 years. And he's got, I mean, he just deals with it every day for 360 months. And, you know, that's the stuff that counts. And so particularly, I want to, I want to read you something that will take less than 30 seconds. Uh, and I am doing these things on uh, leadership in the time of COVID-19. And so this is my six leadership requirements for a leader of anything. Be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be positive, and walk in the other person's shoes. That's your job. And I, and I really want to say that every leader who's listening to us, watching us, whatever. What you have done in the last 120 days and what you will do in the next 120 days will define the quality of your contribution as an adult, adult human being. This is a ball game. I mean, how you behave now, that is the marker, my dearly beloved friends. You know, we'll, we'll see, but this is the ball game. How do you behave? Which doesn't mean that if I have a restaurant and the restaurant is empty that I can afford to keep all my employees on. But what I can do is afford to do what I was just reading about the other day. The guy who had a little thing like a restaurant and he mortgaged his house. He mortgaged his house so that he could help the people who work for him. He couldn't make their life perfect or what have you, but he was able to keep a few of them on and he was able to you know, and so many things you can do. Somebody said to me, well, what can you do? And I said, well, one of the things this guy did is he, he went out and he found an expert. And the expert was an expert in things like, how do you apply for unemployment benefits? How do you beat the bureaucracy or stay ahead of it with all this stuff? And he gave him that kind of counseling, you know, because I mean, you've read it. I've read it. The number of people who have just been completely flummoxed by the bureaucracy associated with getting the check or, or whatever else it was. Uh, but you know, I just thought that was, I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. That's an absolutely uh, incredible insights. So clearly concise and summarized there. I think that's, that's a great place to end, but uh, I need to bring up a few things that I, I certainly took away from this. Obviously people first and foremost, they are everything. I love the competitive spirit, how that drives your lifelong learning process, the competition you bring in. And then I think a point that you brought up that just really stuck with me there is how anyone can have a tremendous impact on the people they come in contact with. You don't have to be a CEO, a surgeon. You can be just that person in the community. And I absolutely love that, Tom. And I need to do one other thing because your book transformed me 
the the week I read that, I was a fundamentally different person when I read In Search of Excellence. So I just for this has been years in the making. So I just wow. wanted to say thank you for that. It really did have that much of an impact on me and then your work after that. So so I really appreciate it. Where else can we have the listeners stay connected with you, find out more about you and your work? Uh, e- e- easy as can be, TomPeters.com. Uh, you know, we've got, I've done several interviews like this. The links to them are all there. Uh, 20 years worth of my slides were there, are there, papers are there. We give away everything. And so uh, at TomPeters.com, and we've worked very hard to make it user-friendly, and I think we've done a pretty good job. So, you know, welcome aboard. There's a, there's a related website called excellencenow.com that has some specialty stuff, but you'll find a link to that too. So lo- lo- love, to have, love to have anybody visit us and it's all there. It's all yours. Uh, Fantastic. Not a, not, a, not a single proprietary item in, in the, uh, on the website. Well, we'll certainly have all that linked up, but Tom Peters, I really, truly, from the bottom of my heart, can't thank you enough uh, for coming on What Got You There. Well, it's been a, it's been an incredible pleasure and, uh, all the people who are, you know, who are watching us or listening to us, uh, this really is an, a wonderful time to make an extraordinary difference to the fellow human beings that if you're a leader, probably a high percentage you are of something or a non-leader, as you said, uh, le- leadership is everybody's business. You know, leadership is I said to somebody, you want to know the definition of leadership on a crappy day when the sleet is coming down in Boston, it's coming to work with a smile. That's an act of leadership and making people just feel a teeny bit better. Tom Peters, thanks again. You guys made it to the end of another episode of What Got You There? I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. If you found value in this, the best way you can support the show is giving us a review, rating it, sharing it with your friends, and also sharing on social. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Looking forward to you guys listening to another episode.